Another thing that we've achieved in the past year is to get fewer and more powerful filaments. We calculated about two years ago that one of the problems in achieving high yield is getting the filaments strong enough, the individual filaments carrying enough current to contain the very hot ions. So we calculated that the 128 uh, filaments that we were producing were dividing the current up into two small pieces. So we modified, we had a, a machine shop locally modify our cathode so it would produce 64 instead of 128. So we actually doubled the amount of current per uh, filament. Experimentally, we got half as many filaments and they were lasting longer. So instead of being totally disrupted, the filaments are still present at the front of the, the front of the uh, current sheet that's over here. And the filaments are still present. They're obviously not as regular as we want them to be. We want them to be very regular to have e extremely symmetrical compression, but they are there. Uh, ignore those things. Those are on the ICCT chips. Uh, we have to clean those, those off. So this gives an idea of our recent progress. This is since we installed the modified beryllium electrodes. This is our third set of electrodes, or our third modification of the electrodes. And since we installed these electrodes back in September of last year, we've had a big rise in fusion yield. We've also found that we can clean off the anode from tiny particles that are produced from the shot by a cleaning mix of deuterium and, and nitrogen. And if we only count the shots that are made after the cleaning shots, then they look like that. So most of these low yield shots are the ones that we knew wouldn't produce high yield because they're the cleaning shots. This also, by the way, shows one thing about research. This research does not proceed in a straight line. You can see ups and downs, and that's not random variation. That's us deliberately changing the conditions to search for the way up. The way I, I relate this to people's experience is research is very much like a mountain hike. And if you've been on a mountain hike, you know that you can't climb a mountain by only going up. The trail always goes down. And even though that sounds like a waste of energy, it's the only way to get out the mountain is going ridge by ridge. And that's what we've been doing uh, in a research program that has lasted quite a long time. Uh, we've been doing this for 16 years at our facility up in Middlesex. And like most research projects, it does take longer than you think. So you're seeing this for the first time among the general public. These are some pictures that we've taken over the last couple of weeks, which shows the problem of cleaning off the boron products. So we found that the boron actually chemically reacts with the beryllium to produce this pinkish substance, which is beryllium boride. Um, but with our cleaning shots, as the cleaning shots proceed, we can see that it's being eroded. First, you have this phenomena of the erosion producing tiny grooves. These grooves, again, this is about one centimeter. These grooves are spaced about 100 microns across. This is a phenomenon we see even in water erosion. So over thousands of years, water will erode sandstone or some other very uh, even smooth material 
into these linear uh, grooves. So that's what we're seeing here, except the erosion happens over a millionth of a second instead of 10,000 years. And we're seeing that this process is starting to work because these have the pink color, which is intrinsic to beryllium boride. But I don't know whether you can see this on the screen. Can people see that this is starting to become rainbow colors rather than pink? So that means we're getting to the stage that the layer is so thin, the colors are being produced by the interference of light, such as the colors of a, a soap bubble. So that shows that we're making progress. Um, now we want to redesign our cleaning shots so that uh, we can do this in just one cleaning shot instead of a dozen, but we are making progress. And uh, this shows how the cleaning is actually proceeding. So this is the top of the anode, and this is the bottom. And the top is being cleaned more thoroughly because the sheath proceeds downwards and accelerates. So this part is exposed to the radiation from the sheath for the entire 1.8 microseconds. This is exposed for less and less. And this, of course, is only exposed for the very end. So the cleaning is, you can see the color up here is much grayer. Um, and finally, this is sort of an indication of what we need to clean. This is the very top of the anode. This is the insulator. And you can see these little particles, which are presumably beryllium. Those are things that shouldn't be there and that we need to clean off because if they're there during the shot, the current concentrates irregularly. And again, for good compression, you have to have a great deal of symmetry. Uh, an analogy is if you're trying to get 10 or 12 motorboats to converge within the smallest circle, they all have to be running at the exact same speed. If some are slower than the size of the circle that they're in, the minimum size is much greater. And that's what we find. If there's a little bit of asymmetry, you get much less density and therefore much less fusion because the fusion rate goes as the square of the density. So the next steps are uh, optimization of the breakdown, which means end of the cleaning. Then we're going to move from the mix to pure decaporane fuel. And finally, we're going to increase the power of our machine. Our machine actually has 12 capacitors on it, but only eight are attached. We're experimenting first at the lower level. So sometime this year, we're going to attach the other four, and that's going to boost our current from approximately 1.8 megaamps to approximately 2.4 to 2.7. So since that's going to make our filaments bigger, everything's going to get better. Theoretically, there's a scaling of the current to the eighth power. So we expect a big boost in yield, and that's when we expect to enter the stage where we're trying to get net energy. So finally, I have a few more minutes. Yeah, I want to explain how we expect to get energy out of the machine. So after we complete the research phase, and we get net energy, we need a much bigger energy engineering phase to create a lab, to transform a lab device into a working fusion generator, which can roll down an assembly line like a car. So these generators will be small enough that you're not going to be building them on site like a, uh, you know, a fission reactor. You're going to be manufacturing them like automobiles which again will make them much cheaper. 
So this is how we expect to get the energy out. So there are two main methods. One is the beam of ions that comes in this anim uh, animation and moves downward. So this is a pulse about 100 nanoseconds long. And when this pulse enters an energy collection device, which is simplified as this coil, it creates a magnetic field. So again, if you have a changing electric current, di dt in technical terms, we create a changing magnetic field. That changing magnetic field induces a changing electric field that is azimuthal. So when you have a coil or a more complicated uh, geometric pattern of a conductor, you create electricity in the conductor. The conductor in turn creates a contrary electric field which slows down the beam. So you have a transfer of energy inductively from the beam to the current in the coil. So the current in the coil flows to a second set of very fast capacitors that will store the energy. Part of that stored energy will be used for the next pulse, and part of it will be fed to the grid to be converted to alternating current. Now, the trick here is, as this exits the uh, coil, everything will happen in reverse. So what you need is a very fast switch, which closes as soon as the charge has been transferred to the capacitors and doesn't allow the backflow. So that's another, there are such switches based on diamonds, but that's another challenge for the engineering part of the uh, project. So, so, a third of the energy is released in the form of X-rays. So, the X-rays are captured in a device of our own uh, invention. This is a patented device that's based on the extremely well-understood photoelectric effect. Uh, discovered a century ago by Einstein. So what happens is the X-rays pass into a series of electric of conducting plates and electrical grids. So for each of these thin conducting plates, some of the X-rays are converted through the photoelectric effect to electron energy. So the electrons exit these thin plates, and that's why they're so thin, so the x-rays, the electrons can get out of them without losing much energy. And they're captured by these charged grids. So the grids are charged at various voltages to capture the electrons at various energies. And we've calculated that this device can operate at about 80% total efficiency. So again, this pulse of energy is captured and fed into the, a fast capacitor and from there into the grid. So the ultimate aim is a compact 5 megawatt generator, which pulses 200 times a second. That's about as fast as a a uh, gasoline motor fires its spark plugs with a capital cost for with mass production of about 10 cents a watt, which is about a factor of 10 cheaper than any existing energy source, and with an electric energy cost of about half a cent, 
per kilowatt hour. This is about 30 times less than what we're paying here in New Jersey. The key challenges for the engineering part is cooling the anode with compressed helium. Uh, the material questions of the beryllium boron compounds, can we actually use these compounds to shield the beryllium from erosion and getting the electrodes? Ivy or Ivy Karenitsis? Yes. We have to train the soul. Um, so either we, um, in order to get the maintenance down, we want the electrodes to last at least a month. It would take about a day to replace them. Um, so that's about 500 million pulses. Uh, so the erosion is a problem. The heat is a problem, and the reactions with the different materials is a potential problem. And finally, we're going to be functioning at a much higher temperature than the experimental device because this is pulsing 200 times a second. The uh, background gas is going to be at about 2000 C, comparable with uh, conditions within a jet engine or a rocket engine. So that means we're going to have different chemical conditions and different breakdown conditions than we do in the experiment. So all of that will take a project that is probably at least 10 or 20 times bigger. We now have a staff of uh, basically uh, three or four people. We'll probably need a staff of about 150 to 200 scientists and engineers. Um, and a budget of much larger, maybe 150 or 200 million dollars. So uh, we raise this money from the general public through crowdfunding, and currently we're raising two and a half million dollars. And if you're interested, you can get information from WeFunder, which is the uh, crowdfunding platform. We're not allowed to discuss the uh, finances outside of that platform. So thank you very much, and I hope we have time for some questions. Our videos come out of LPP Fusion's research in fusion energy, the energy which will power a future of abundance for all with a sustainable economy and a clean environment. Goods, housing, and transportation will be affordable to all once fusion kicks in. Fusion energy is the key to building a better world now. Support fusion research, $10 a month, at lppfusion.com support. The link is in the description. Thanks.